morning, North Highland Church. How are we doing this morning? It is so good to see all of you here this morning. I'd just like to give a shout out, say thank you to Pastor Brad for allowing me to teach this morning and just to dive into God's word with you. It's always so much fun and I always love that. Um, we are in the middle of a values series right now where we're talking about having a good foundation as a Christian. And so far we've talked about um, having Christ, right? He's the thing that holds everything together. Scripture, uh, it's a light to our feet, a lamp to our path. And the church, when we're in a group of people, there's just something about being together, right? Well, all of those values are amazing. And what uh, Pastor Brad asked me to speak about today is actually two of them. But until you have that strong foundation, it's really hard to do these two things. These two things are serving and compassion. And you have to have compassion in order to serve. You can't really serve without compassion. So I love that um, these two things we're going to be talking about today. Now, as you can see, I have this large box. And I brought some items that are going to kind of help us remember um, just some ways that we need to remember how to serve with compassion, okay? So the first thing I have is a bag of cat food, okay? A bag of cat food. Are you all tracking with me? No? Okay. Um, the second thing, this might be my favorite, box of donuts. Anyone? Okay. Yes, we got some box of donuts here. Those are really good. I'm definitely eating one uh, when I get done up here. And then the last thing, we're talking about serving in compassion, is a trophy. Are you all tracking with me? Not, not yet? Okay, we'll get there. We'll get there. So I just want you to kind of keep these in mind as we go because there's a point to it, okay? So I'm actually going to be talking from two different sections of Scripture, but they're all in the same chapter. So you're not going to have to be flipping around your Bible or anything. But um, So I'm going to read one. I'm going to talk about it for a little bit. Then I'm going to read another portion of Scripture and talk about it, okay, just to kind of prep you on that. But where this chapter falls in the ministry of Jesus is it's at the very end. It's actually right before he starts Passion Week or the week where he goes to the cross. So this is kind of like his last, quote unquote, week of, of his earthly ministry before he ends up going to the cross. And so we are going to be in Matthew chapter 20. So if you want to go ahead and turn there to Matthew chapter 20. And in this specific section of scriptures, he has all of his disciples around him, his followers. Um, they even have brought family members with them. And so he's got this large group of people. And so we come upon this and it's really honestly kind of the last thing before Jesus goes to the cross. So we're going to read this together. Matthew chapter 20, we're going to start in verse 20. And it says, then the mother of Zebedee's sons came to him, Jesus, with her sons, kneeling down and asking something from him. And he said to her, what do you wish? And she said to him, grant that these two sons of mine may sit, one on your right hand and the other on the left, in your kingdom. But Jesus answered and said, you don't know what you ask. Are you able to drink the cup that I'm about to drink and be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? And they said to him, we are able. So he said to them, you will indeed drink my cup and be baptized with the baptism that I'm baptized with. But to sit on my right hand and on my left, that's not mine to give. But it is for those for whom it is prepared by my father. And when the ten heard it, which I love this, when the ten heard it, the other two, ten disciples, they were greatly displeased with the two brothers. Probably an understatement there. But Jesus called them to himself and said, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lorded over them, and those who are great exercise authority over them, yet it shall not be so among you. But whoever desires to become great among you, let him be your servant. And whoever desires to be first among you, let him be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. Let's pray. Lord, today, let your word guide us, Lord, just like Pastor Brad preached last week, that it would be a light to our feet, a lamp to our path, God, and it would guide us as we go about our week, God, not just here 
in service, Lord, but let your light illuminate something as we go throughout our week, God, that you can show us and speak to us even as we go about our everyday business. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so in this passage of scriptures, we have these two men, these two disciples, and they are eyeing the position. They're eyeing the position of being at the top, in glory, next to Jesus, on a throne. They are eyeing this position. They have even gotten their mom involved and said, hey, if you ask him, maybe, you know, he'll be a little more, like, willing to do this for us. And so... When she goes and asks Jesus, it's like they've kind of missed the entire point of Jesus' entire ministry. These men have been with Jesus every day for three years, watching him in and out, and never once was Jesus ever about elevating himself to a place of, of power and thrones and lording it over people. The part about this that was just so interesting to me is you had Jesus and all the people who followed him, and then he had 12 disciples out of that, and then even closer than the 12, he had three guys that were like his inner bros, I guess. They're like his inner disciples. Guess who two of the three were? James and John, the people who are requesting to be next to him on thrones. It's like even though they had like the inner workings and the inner ear of Jesus, it wasn't enough for them. They wanted the power. They wanted the fame. They wanted the recognition. They wanted people to look at them and go, oh, we're not worthy. Oh, we're not worthy. You are so much greater than us. That's what they were wanting. And this caused such a division between the disciples that Jesus actually had to go over to the ten and say, come here. Let me tell you something. This is not at all what I'm talking about. This is actually a kingdom like the world is doing. The Gentiles, the worldly kingdoms, are the ones who want all the power and the fame. But amongst you, it should not be like this. It should not be like this among you. It should not be so. And if you look at the kingdoms of this world, and we live in this, right, every day, if you want to be the first, if you want to be the best, you better climb the ladder the highest, and you better punch everyone or kick everyone on the way up, and you better leave them bloodied and bruised because, you know what, getting to the top matters the most. Getting the accolades matters the most. It doesn't matter who you take down on the way up. All that matters is you get up to the top first. That's what the world says. And Jesus is saying, hey, guys, that's not what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about elevating yourself to make others look bad. I'm not talking about elevating yourself so that when you look at other people, you're like, huh, I'm better than you. He's like, this is not at all what I've asked you to do in my kingdom. In fact, if you look at the life of Jesus, he never once elevated himself. Instead, he would submit himself, and he would serve, and he would do those things. He would go to the people that no one else would go to. And he says, it shall not be so among you. You're not supposed to be all about your thrones. Whoever desires to become great among you, let him be your servant. And whoever desires to be first among you, let him be your slave. Now, I'm going to be honest. When I read this, I was like, I would rather not read the word slave. It really has terrible connotations for our country, and I really don't want to read it. So I found every translation that I could. I went to every translation of the Bible. Can I tell you, every single translation used the word slave. So I was like, interesting. Now I'm going to have to go a little bit deeper. So I dug into this a little bit deeper. I actually found the word that is actually used, and there's not really an English word that we use, so that's why they're using the word slave. And, but the word actually means in the original language, which I'm not speaking because I don't speak it, the original language is actually something called a bond servant, a bond servant, okay? I'm going to read from this expository dictionary because it's going to, boil it down in a whole lot faster than I can, okay? This is what that word slave slash bond servant means. It was originally the lowest term in the scale of servitude, 
It was the most common and general word for servant. And it came to mean one who gives himself up to the will of another. And this is what, this is what sets it apart, though, okay? One who gives himself up to the will of another, indicating subjection without the idea of bondage. So it means that you're submitting yourself to someone without someone making you do it, having bondage over you. You are willfully saying, I am submitting, and it's not because they're making you, it's because you're choosing to do that. It blew my mind this week. It absolutely blew my mind because you're like, if you want to be great, you got to be a servant. If you want to be first, you're actually going to willfully subject yourself, not because they're lording it over you, but because you're willing to do that. A great example of this comes just a couple chapters later in Matthew. When Jesus is in the Garden of Gethsemane and he's praying and he's saying, Lord, I don't want to go to the cross. Lord, I don't want to die. Isn't there another way? But not my will, but your will be done. And it's not that God the Father was saying, you're doing this whether you want to or not. Jesus was saying, I willfully subject myself to whatever you want me to do, Father. I will do it for you because I love you. It was without the idea of bondage. And yet here James and John come wanting the glory of the throne. And it was almost like they were putting Jesus in bondages, saying, hey, you said that we'd be in your kingdom, so we are expecting you to put us up on a high place. We expect you to do that, so you better do what we want because we deserve it. So they're actually not being submissive. They're actually trying to put Jesus in bondage and say, hey, we've done such a good job, you need to promote us. You need to promote us. Jesus says, and he's reminding the disciples of this, just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Jesus submitted himself to the will of the Father, not because God was forcing him, but because he wanted to do it. So the model that Jesus is giving us Point number one, serving is our responsibility. Serving is our responsibility. Now, if I'm honest, when I sit in here at church on a Sunday morning, I can say amen to that and be like, absolutely, serving is our responsibility. That's why I'm a greeter and I do all these great things. But I'm going to tell you, when Monday morning hits and and I'm in my groove at the office, it's a little bit harder to serve. I was a school teacher for 12 years and one of the classroom or one of the classrooms that I taught in, it was at the end of this very long hallway. And so every morning I would get up and I would be trekking all the way down to the very last room where I was. And I'd pass other classrooms along the way. And in those classrooms were other teachers working. And um, I'm kind of a chipper person in the morning. So I would pass people's classrooms and try and talk with them. So the first lady, she, every time I would pass her, she was always um, had pictures of her cats. She was always just talking about her cats. She had pictures of her cats. She was kind of like this cat lady, okay? Um, She would always talk about how she was drinking wine with her cats. I mean, she was into her cats. Like, she was doing whatever she could with her cats. But she was also really mean. And I know this is whatever, but, like, she was mean. And I was like, I don't really want to talk to you anymore. Because every time I would go in there and say good morning, she would either ignore me Or she'd be like, why are you so happy? Just mean. Just mean people. And after a while, I'm going to be honest, I kind of got sick of saying good morning to her. Because I'm like, why are you so mean? I'm not starting my day off with this negativity. Right? I can just walk on past you. You're going to be rude? Fine. I don't even have to engage with you. So that was kind of her. I had another person who every single time we had a faculty meeting, they would lay out like a little spread of delicious food. And this person would always get to the faculty meeting like five minutes before everyone, and then they would pile their plate full of donuts. And guess what? They would always take my favorite kind, and I, by the time I would get up there, mine wouldn't be there. 
And y'all are laughing, but you can kind of see where I'm talking about. It's a whole lot easier to serve people that are willing to be served than these people who are really just grating on my last nerve. Then there was a lady across the hallway from me, or a teacher across the hallway from me, who would always one-up everything I did. I'd be like, hey, look at this cool flip book I did about the states of matter. And she'd be like, well, not only did we do the flip book, but I also taught my students like this entire rap and we're going to be performing it, you know, at the PTA. And I'm like, of course you are. And she always had everything put together. Like my book bins were labeled with duct tape and hers were like super Pinteresty. Okay. But she was always, 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 this person was always one upping me. And so again, it's a whole lot easier to say serving is my responsibility on a Sunday morning when we're sitting in church. It's a whole other thing when you're walking down the hallway and your life is intersecting with these people who are not kind, who are very selfish, and who are full of pride. That's a whole lot harder to serve than all of you beautiful people here on a Sunday morning. Am I right? Absolutely. All right, let's go to our next set of scriptures. We're going to stay, like I said, right in Matthew 20. And this is immediately after this previous set of scriptures. So here we go. It says, Now, as they went out of Jericho, a great multitude followed him. And behold, two blind men sitting by the road. When they heard that Jesus was passing by, they cried out, saying, Have mercy on us, O Lord, son of David. And the multitude warned them that they should be quiet. But they cried out all the more, saying, Have mercy on us, O Lord, son of David. So Jesus stood still and called them and said, What do you want me to do for you? And they said to him, Lord, that our eyes may be opened. So Jesus had compassion and touched their eyes, and immediately their eyes received sight, and they followed him. All right. Now, I know Jesus was fully God and fully man, and he probably didn't get exasperated. But almost when I was reading this passage, you know how you've just had one of those days where you're just tired, and you feel like, I mean, Jesus had just dealt with all of the squabbling disciples, and he's getting ready, and he's moving, and now there's two more people who are crying out and saying, hey, we need something from you. Hey, we need something from you. And I know Jesus, because he's perfect, he was probably not exasperated, but I felt for him. And I was like, man, I would have been exasperated by this point. Because it's just two more people that are needing something from him. But he looks at them and he's like, what do you want, what do you want for me to do for you? What do you want for me to do for you? Now, these guys probably could have asked for anything, right? And it's such a surprise because it's not what you think they're going to ask for. They said, Lord, that our eyes may be opened. And it was in that moment that I'm sure Jesus was like, wow, these guys get it. These two random strangers, blind men, they actually get what the kingdom is about. It's not about status. It's not about money. Oh, Jesus, make us one of your disciples. No, 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 no. They said, we want to see you. Open our eyes that we see you, Jesus. They finally get it. So Jesus, so amazing, his heart starts just beating with compassion for these men. On the side of the road saying, we're blind, we just want our eyes to be open. His heart starts beating with compassion and He gives them sight. Their sight is restored. Not only is their sight restored, they didn't create any division. In fact, they add to the kingdom that day. These blind men on the side of the road get what the other disciples were not able to get, even after spending every day with Jesus. Compassion is our heartbeat. Serving is our responsibility, but it's got to come from our heart beating with compassion, just like Jesus. So it was very easy for me to walk through the hallways of my school and ignore these people who were annoying and frustrating to me because I wasn't required to, right? 
I don't have to talk to them. They're just going to fill me with negativity for my day. I don't need to do that with them. Until the Lord placed it on my heart and said, Stacy, I want you to see them. When you're walking down the hallway, I want you to see them. And I'm like, yeah, 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 yeah. But do you know how rude they are? Do you know how annoying they are? Do you know that they always are so filled with themselves and pride? You're wanting me to see them? I already see them, Lord. I see them. And he said, no, 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 no. I want you to see them like I see them. And so I felt very convicted, very convicted. And so I made it a point every morning to go to the lady, mean cat lady, and just say good morning. Good morning. It didn't have to be this long thing, but I made it a point every morning, even if she didn't respond, even if she looked at me like I was terrible, even if she, I didn't care. I was like, I knew that I had to do that. The lady who was, or the person who was always taking all the donuts, being the donut hog, I went up to them and just started talking with them. Just started saying, hey, what's your favorite kind of donut? Seeing, seeing them. The person who was across the hallway from me, I just started going in and saying, hey, you always have everything so put together. Can you help me add something to what I'm already doing? Hey, is there anything I can help you with? I know you always got it together, but is there anything I can help you with? And just started seeing them. I do not think it is an accident that the Bible has these two stories, one after the other. Because you have two disciples who should have been the most knowledgeable about Jesus' life and ministry. Their eyes should have been open to what the Lord was doing, but their eyes were blind to what was really important. In fact, they were just seeking themselves. They were blind to it. And then you had these two blind men who could have been completely self-absorbed, but all they wanted was that their eyes would be opened to Jesus. It came down to their heart's motivation. The disciples wanted it to be about the disciples. And the two blind men wanted it to be about Jesus. It came down to their heart motivation. The two disciples, they caused so much division. Even within the brotherhood of the disciples, they caused division. They actually ended up taken away from the kingdom. They actually were blind to what God was asking them to do. And those two blind men actually added to the kingdom. They were the true disciples that day. And it becomes this inverted kingdom and it's what Jesus does. He says, you think it's this way, but it's this way. You think it's this way, it's this way. It's not what you think it is. You think it's about being the best disciple? False. It's about opening your eyes to see me and see other people how I see them. You really want to be great? You got to be a servant. You really want to be first? You got to willfully subject yourself to another person, not because they're forcing you to, but because you want to. We think so many times it's about us and our accolades and what we do. And man, you know, I can't put myself out there because those people are mean. Those people are negative. I'm not going to put that negativity in my life. Guess what? Those people need Jesus. And you have the hope that can take their heart that is so filled with meanness and bitterness and anger and pride. And you can say, let me introduce you to someone who was not any of that. And he was the greatest person to ever live. If you look at the life of Jesus, he modeled to us. Serving is our responsibility. Compassion is is our heartbeat. Keep going in the book of Matthew and you're going to see Jesus live this out because not only did he serve, but he washed his disciples' feet, nasty feet. And then he showed compassion to the people who were crucifying him on the cross by saying, Lord, don't hold this against them. Compassion for people, not people who are just being mean on a Monday morning because they won't respond to my good morning. I mean, he's talking about Forgiving people who are actually crucifying him. Jesus is this amazing model that we can look to. 
So I want to encourage you this morning. This is my last point. When we look to Jesus, when we actually open our eyes and we look to Jesus, we can serve all of those around us with compassion. And the kingdom will grow. The kingdom will grow. Hey, my name is Sarah, and I am the crazy cat lady. I have an orange one with white stripes. His name's Phineas. I have a dark one with gray stripes. His name is King Julian. I even picked one up off the streets just the other day, and he is so kind. I love cats, so much so that I used to ignore everybody around me. I used to ignore Stacy as she would stop by my classroom, but then one day she asked me, why do you love your cats so much? I began to reflect and remember the time that I was actually going through an abusive relationship. Unable to recognize the manipulative behaviors, I turned to cats as a coping skill. But then Stacy stood by my side showed me the hope of the Lord and said, this is where you can receive healing. Hey, uh, my name is Benito and uh, well, I wanna let y'all in on a little secret. If you go to the break room five minutes before everyone else, you don't get one donut, but you get two extra donuts. <laughs> I mean, who doesn't like donuts? <sighs> you know, they might call you a donut hogger, but <laughs> I mean, I'm in this game and I'm winning first place. <laughs> you know, uh, everyone's a hogger. Uh, you know, Stacy was the first person to reach out to me and say, why? Truth is, I come from a family that really doesn't have much. And so I feel like if I don't hog, if I don't get what I want to get that I can't have, then I have nothing. Hey, I'm Jonathan, and uh, you know, some people would say I'm a bragger. I think deep down they just know I'm I'm better, you know. Like uh, I could have gone D1. I got the trophies to prove it. I, I I was your favorite player's favorite player. I was that kind of guy, you know. Uh, but when I met Stacy, she showed me that all that didn't matter. The trophies, the achievements, they didn't matter, but the love and compassion she showed, that's what mattered. She was the first person to ask me how I was actually doing, and that's what led me to the truth. Each one of those stories is a true story of people that I encountered as I was, you know, just walking down the hallway and our lives would intersect on a daily basis. But I wanna be honest with you, I didn't know their story because I was judging them from the beginning. But when the Lord challenged me and said, I want you to see them. And I actually humbled myself and asked the Lord for a heart of compassion for them. Serving them became something that I was joyful about. Because if I would have just stopped and said, whatever, I don't need their negativity in my life, whatever. They're frustrating, they're full of pride, they're selfish, I don't need that in my life. They would have missed out on what Jesus can do in their life. And it's only because it was me. I was the one who was stopping them from finding that. I was the one because I was so caught up in me getting glory and me you know, I don't need their negativity. Me basically being self-absorbed. So can I challenge you this morning that there are people in your life that you have written off, that you have ignored for certain reasons. 
But I want to ask you a question. Who do you need to stop and see this week? Who do you need to stop and see that the Lord has in your life for a reason? For you to start having a heart of compassion for them so that you can serve them. Not because you're being told to, but because you actually want to serve them. Stand with me this morning. For some of you, maybe you've never opened your eyes to the salvation and the knowledge of Jesus' salvation. And maybe this morning you just need to say, Lord, I need to open my eyes to you with every head bowed, every eye closed. This morning, if you're saying, I need to find Jesus. I need to see Jesus for the first time. I want my eyes opened to all that he is. He sounds like such an amazing, amazing guy. He is, and he can turn your life around. If today you would like to open your eyes to the salvation that comes through Jesus Christ, will you just raise your hand and say, that's me. I want to open my eyes to the salvation of Jesus Christ. Thank you. Thank you, Jesus. What a great message we just got to listen to. Thank you again for choosing to tune into North Highland Church. I really hope to see you next week. Have a good one.